Welcome to the fifth Paradoxical Non-Dual Psychology Conference. We usually like to start off with some introductions. My name now is Gary Zhu, or uh, could be Gary Nobody. Lethbridge, maybe we can just start and just give a sense of who we are, like our name. We don't have to give you our long story. It's all a bunch of crap anyway. And where are you from? Yeah. Lisa Lethbridge. Uh, Trent, Portland, Oregon. Karen Lethbridge. Marcia Lethbridge. Sherry Lethbridge. <coughs> Connie Metzenhap. Daryl Metzenhap. Aha, uh -huh, Lethbridge. This is Maya Bear. Carol Barron. Ernst. Daryl Lethbridge. Okay. Elizabeth Hillspring. Shanna Lethbridge. Kelly, you got a name. Ryan Calvary. Uh, Julie Lethbridge. Alexi Lethbridge. Huh? medication and for people that are new they'll find it can be a bit of a shock but it's a three-stage meditation the first stage is a humming meditation together about 10 uh, hums on the out breath and then we go through a second phase what I like to say is a little catharsis where on a count of five we use our voice to clear out any cobwebs any sense of pain any contraction and just really enjoy ourselves and you know it might be quite frightening for those uh, for, this is the first time they've experienced that, and that's okay, you're going to learn something today. And the third phase is a nice kind of uh, back to being uh, a Buddha and getting into a hollow bound of meditation. So let's start off with the uh, humming meditation. more.
Okay, now for the second part. We'll go through three rounds, and on the count of five, we use our voice to cathart out and just open up every cell of our body and just enjoy ourselves. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. Ah! to the other side. Come on now. Stop acting like such pansies. <laughs> Not much effort involved this in just two days except for now. <laughs> okay? So <laughs> one, two, three, four, five. Ah! for this, we can give you those references later. <laughs> okay, so, count of five. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> there we go. Very nice. And now we can go back to being Buddhas and be like a hollow bamboo in this moment. No cares or concerns, no problems, nothing to hang on to, and just let existence flow through us. We're hollow inside, so we'll just do a nice two-minute hollow bamboo meditation right now. Another minute. Okay, come back. <coughs> okay, my talk consists of this is it. That concludes my talk. Are there any questions? Hardy har har. Okay, so um, I thought I was looking for a song to set this whole talk up. And I came to Highway to Hell, ACDC. Uh, but the problem is that's a pretty good song. And it didn't quite have the feel of what I was looking for because <coughs> what this talk is all about is awakening through the black holes of existence, our dark holes in our being. And the problem is we are, we are such grabbers. We are grabbers in existence. When we start on the journey, we decide, okay, I am going to go for, like, I am going to go for the light. I am going to go for the enlightenment. I just want bliss 
and enlightenment and light and ecstasy and be the answer. And of course, it's like the law of reverse effect. We desire being the light and the answer, and instead what we get is misery, suffering, being in the black hole, not being the answer, being totally lost, that sort of thing. It's like we won't only want life, we just want life, but we're, we're not interested in death. And death is where we end up. So uh, it really is the law of reverse effect. So what we have to do is be willing to go right to where we don't want to go. And that is, we try, we're almost, we're trying to be positive thinkers. We try to grab enlightenment. I know myself, I tried to storm enlightenment, did all the classical things, you know, meditating for four hours, doing all the non do inquiries, doing, oh, you know, who am I, that sort of thing, reading all the books, reading them again, starting from scratch, uh, listening to discourses, uh, listening to teachers, on and on and on the list goes, okay? So, what really, really happens is we end up in this other place. We end up um, having to deal with our dark holes of our being. And so to break this down a little bit, what I've got is I've, I've broken it down into some different dark holes. Okay, and so the first dark hole I'm going to talk about today is the midnight one, the midnight black. And for those who have experienced it, they'll, they'll know what I'm talking about. The midnight black is because what happens on our journey of seeking, on, um, as, we, uh, as we have been seeking for many years, it's what Audie Daw uh, talked about. We get into the total rot. It's like we were so intense and we wanted it all, but instead after a while, we get our total rot, our, t our ego starts to fall away, we get into hopelessness, and we start to really realize that, oh my God, this is not a fantasy come true, really. This is like a total descent down an elevator. It's like a total descent down into the dungeon of existence. It's like a total descent down into the black hole of being. And I have had that experience myself of almost wandering around in existence, somehow trapped in some sort of seeker's hell, whereas I'm lost in hell, wandering, drifting, trying to look for the answer, never finding the answer, always walking, always going. And, and then you know the madness starts to sink in after a while because it starts to dawn on a person, my god, this could go on forever. This wandering around, seeking for the answer. This, it's like lost in the dark side of the moon, wandering around. It's like, or meeting someone, I remember in Vancouver, I met someone who was having a bad drug trip, and he was wandering around. He says, I'm lost, but I don't know, I don't know how to get out of here. And I'm just wandering around. And you could see his total forlorn lostness. But he was still somehow hoping that somehow he could get out, he could kind of find, and we get hooked into thinking somehow we can still actually find the answer. We're still going to grasp the answer. We're still going to get there. And it gets terrible. It gets awful. And all of a sudden, what can happen, of course, is suicide starts to become an option. I know Jason's going to be talking about that later today. But suicide, all of a sudden, even though you've had all these wonderful, blissful experiences and felt the flowers showering around you and you know cosmic consciousness, Better, and better than in the books, and a thousand suns feel like they're arising. Here I am, still seeking. And so, you see, it gets to a pretty bad place. And then one has to look at, in this place of the midnight darkness, where it's so dark, is there something wrong with my whole strategy? Has the whole strategy been off from the get-go? And that is where we get to and I can remember reading this from the Heart Sutra many years ago. Reading this and I think, hmm, what's that? And, and that is the wisdom of non-attainment. And that means, you know, we've heard the cliche, there's uh, nowhere to go and nothing to do. But it actually is worse than that. Uh, 
what happens was one day you realize, I could be seeking and lost and wandering around forever. So that's not going to work out. That's, that's just going to be, an, I could just be a forlorn creature wandering around forever. And I have gotten so exhausted, the only option left is stop. Give it all up. Let it go. F it. Let the whole thing go. Just stop. Crash to the ground. So when I, when I hear Bono talk from you two, and I know people think you two are corporate rockers, but he does talk about sweaters when you get down onto your knees. You were down, <coughs> <coughs> not even on your knees, you were on the ground. You are finished. And one stops in that place, one accepts it, that nothing can be done, and you fall to the ground. And what's strange here is out of the midnight blackness, the midnight sun can appear. Out of the blackest blackness of existence, the black sun underneath all that can arise. So it's a miracle. In the darkest, darkest despair, the great death that Zen calls it, out of that, a wonderful, wonderful, radiant light fire of existence appears all by itself. And the great you know, paradox for someone like me who's one of those strivers, you know, strive, strive, strive. It's like that BTO song, not, not let it ride, it's strive, strive, strive. <laughs> Would you let strive, strive, strive? When in doubt, more striving urgently required. But for me, it's, it is a, uh, such a gift of existence where existence reveals itself all through no effort of my own. Through no effort. All this has been a grand mirage to collapse and see existence is all available right here, right now. The black sun, the midnight sun appears in the ultimate darkness. In that moment of non-existence where it feels so black that you could be lost forever. And there's a gap there because there's a trust that has to happen. And I can remember, for me, it was like the Titanic ship falling into the ocean. And all the Titanic ship of effort and striving and fantasizing and, and all that stuff that goes along with that. All that was like the Titanic ship, and it literally fell in the ocean. And there was a moment of non-existence where I just literally had to no, accept it, no judgment, stop trying to save myself. Because what we do is we're all sort of like addicts. We want the non-dual awakening, but we also want to keep our whole ego game at, at going. We want to still be in control. We want to have it work it both ways. So we've got to give it all up. And that's something that, uh, when they say that it's the flight of the alone to the alone, that means surrender is by yourself. Your little guru can't hold your hand. You've got to do it on your own. Because if a guru was holding your hand, that would be ideal, wouldn't it? That, that would be like someone's taking care of you, making sure now, now everything's going to be OK. We'll just put you back in your crib. So <laughs> that's not true surrender. So it is a jump. It is a leap. So some of Carlos Castaneda's books are pretty wild there, but he does talk about a leap off the, uh, off the abyss of the mountain. So it, it doesn't have to be an actual mountain, but it is a letting go. And so that is the, the, the midnight black uh, letting go where we find this is it. And the, and the hilarious thing, we, it's revealed this has been it all the way along, and it was available all the way along. It's all our hypnotic striving and our ego self-aggrandizement and all. We had to go on a big journey, blah, blah, blah. And it was available all the way along. Now, what happens if we go, yes, I know that. Everybody said, yes, I know that. Been there, done that. I got my coupon uh, punched. I, got all, I read all those books. I heard that talk. Okay, but it gets worse. Because wouldn't existence be nice if it just involved one black hole? But it doesn't just involve one black hole. There are other black holes. And so I want to introduce a second black hole. And uh, rather than call it the, the, uh, the blue hole, I would call it the blues hole. OK? The blues. OK? So and this hole is all about, you see, we're sort of like McDonald types. We just want to go through McDonald's drive through and get someone else to give us the answer. Short order. Put your order in. Get, you know, pick it up at the drive through window and be done. So we, we get so reliant on the other. We want the other to give us the answer. And we, maybe we've learned this a long time ago. Uh, I don't know, one, two, let's see here. I got one other one here. Whoops. How do I get it? Whoop. Going backwards here. I am. Start over. OK, well, there it is. Um, so. And to make this even worse, what happens is, 
You know, at a young age, our, our mummy said, oh, you're so wonderful. You know, you, you're going to be there. You're our little Jesus. You're our little, you're special. You're our little Buddha. And you were there going in there. And you go, I know. And then, and then God whispers in your ear, oh, you're special. And God whispers that to everybody. But you say, yes, I know. Me. And so we have this little deal. Almost talks about we have our black hole inside. But we work deals for other people to fill up our black holes. And we start off with mom, and then later on it's like favorite teachers or relationships. You know, the deal goes, okay, I'll fill up your hole and pretend to like and love you, and you pretend to like and love me and fill up my hole, and that's called a business deal. And that works, and isn't that love? And then you soothe each other, but, and then after a while you decide, okay, I need a spiritual teacher. Okay, and I know, for example, I was all mesmerized by Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, now Asho, lovely discourses. They were wonderful. I thought, oh, grab some of that. I thought to myself, why am I pissing around in law school? This is a, what, a lawyer compared to this awakening gig? I'm wasting my time. So, and then, you know, soothing discourses and like just soothing deep inside, <laughs> soothing that black hole. Okay? And so, you know, um, and it gets soothed, but we're unaware that we actually, it's based on, on somebody else's awareness. And so what can happen is when we start to wake up, though, when we start to work on our issues, the first thing we know is, the, oh my God, I have a black hole inside myself. But you know, like any like dishonest being, <laughs> we actually say, and it's your fault, Jason. <laughs> and so what we do is, rather than owning our own, uh, black holes, we like to be victims and say, you know, I wouldn't be so screwed up if it wasn't for you. And so we project this, all this rage. And if we get into a romantic relationship, it's even worse. We can say, oh, you did this to me. I, you know, I would have been a wonderful being, but you've, done, you've taken away my beingness. You stole something from me. And we really embrace our victimhood. And even as, and we know this in non-dual groups too. Everybody wants to talk about the other person's patheticness. And how they, you know, they, they're so dishonest and inauthentic. They're not uh, working on their own issues. And can you see the, is that, that's a strange projection, isn't it? <laughs> You're not working on your issues. <laughs> so I always thought this song, this is a very existential song. We'll just have a little two-minute clip. It's, when I heard this in class, as I'm still in class. I still go to university. I've been at university for 30 years now. Soon I'll graduate. Okay, so... Here's a little song that reminds me of our dilemma around relationships. Whoops.
I'm insecure and you're ugly. It's your fault. Okay, <laughs> so what this is working at is we've got to actually see that we've got a little con going on. Okay, and that is we're always hoping to be saved by the other. And this is a avoidance of our own dark hole within. So the day that we can realize that that's hopeless to rely on the other to save you, okay? That'll keep you in pain and flailing around and in victimhood for a long time, but it won't help you wake up. So you gotta let go, see the other, grabbing onto the other is hopeless. You've got, we have to have that insight of we have to ride our own nature all the way home. And that means then we have to be responsible for our own beingness. Hmm. Can't be quite so self-righteous then. Because that means then I'm stuck in my own black hole. So then the invitation means, oh my God, oh, I'm in my own black hole now. Okay? But that's the opportunity because once we get awareness of our own black hole and that opportunity, things can start happening. And that it may mean that we have to even work on our false core drivers sit in our presence and know us that, but he was saying, I'm ugly. Well, no judgment in place, what's wrong with the word ugly? Ugly, that's, that's a valuable role in existence. That's a valuable service to everybody, let lets, lets there be a spectrum. And one has to enjoy. And so if you sit, for example, if you go, okay, I'm inadequate, I'm ugly, but with no judgment, I'm gonna just sit in that, that false core and just sit in that pre-verbal sense of amnes and isness in the moment, what happens to the sense of inadequacy or the sense of ugliness as we just sit in it with no judgment? It starts to drop away and it becomes spacious. Inadequacy can become very spacious. It becomes just vulnerability. It just becomes uh, a nice, Vast, vulnerable openness. And that's okay because we're all vulnerable. We're all open beings. Okay? So, we, you know, we get our courage and we, uh, we are working on all these different holes, but we've got some more holes. Because you see, the thing is, what can also happen is You know, we are all little bureaucrats in the sense of, you know, and this is, I've experienced this. Existence can reveal itself, and the person, and it's wonderful, the person feels blissful, and they say, well, you know, that's okay, I think I'm just going to go home now, have a little rest, watch a movie, watch some TV, get on the internet. So what can happen is um, we get on in our non dual journey, and wonderful opening experiences. And then something happens. We decide, nah, not today. <laughs> I'd rather, you know, I don't want my, like, I don't want my life interrupted. <laughs> like I had a, someone said to me, I'd really like to come to your conference. And, oh, I'm all, all passionate like two weeks ago. And then like yesterday, nah, not today. <laughs> I've got three weeks of holidays. I don't want to be disturbed. <laughs> so we get into this 7-Eleven banal, non-risk-taking existence. The whole awakening path is the art of dying, the art of letting go, the art of letting go of your survivalhood. And, but people have little rituals. For example, um, the best, you know, a real popular one is you see, is you say, I'm a positive person. <laughs> and then you tell everybody, you know, I'm positive. We gotta be positive here. We gotta stay positive. And then you know, all the time, oh, I'm positive. I'm really positive. And then, as a, someone emailed me from <coughs> Toronto, if I'm going to work with you, I'm ready to work with you as long as we don't get into all this hopelessness crap. <laughs> so, first session, boom, hopeless. Let's just accept it. Choices awareness of hopelessness. And he got it. But the problem is people just want to be positive thinkers and reject the so-called negative aspects of existence. But, you know, they're, they're still here. Such things as death, darkness, Grief, all those things are still just invitations. They're a part of existence. And if we non judgmentally accept them, they're vast and spacious. But so, you know, we've got to let go of just trying to grab on half to half of existence. 
Or another thing what we can do is we have our little secret rituals. Oh, yes, I'm very non do I'm very spacious, blah, blah, blah. But excuse me, during break, I'm just going to go and smoke a little pot. <laughs> just, you know, it's all going to be very secretive. Maybe I'll put my bathrobe on so then it doesn't smell up my stuff and then I'll take my bathrobe off. And then I can come back and get back into my gig here at the conference. And it could get even worse, you know, and I've, I've shared some of these stories before where we can have non-dual satsang teachers that are involved in heterosexual connections rushing off for quick uh, gay rendezvous through their hookups on their thing just to get that sense of real power. <laughs> and, you know, just a little secret little ritual. But that's a compartmentalized existence. The problem with this whole non-dual awakening, it requires a total 100% surrender, not just like 66% or whatever. And um, another thing that can happen is, uh, is our whole personal will can go. And you, you hear people talking. I get these phone calls all the time. Uh, I'm lost. I've lost my motivation. I said, good. <laughs> Maybe you can stop harassing people. And, you know, and just <laughs> sit in that sense of no ego, no motivation. Have you ever realized, like, what's wrong with being lost if you accept there's nowhere to go? Lost is being beautiful. We're all lost. We're all in this vast spaceship called Earth. We're all lost. And that's okay. If it, it's just an acceptance to let go of this constant personal demand for willpower. And so that's an invitation. But we tend to get into this grayness. Where I even know there's a person that came to the conference, a wonderful person. He was into non-dual being. And then he thought, well, I'm just going to go up north for 10 years. <laughs> I'm just going to hang out and hunt and, uh, you know, <laughs> pretend to be a counselor but not really do anything. And what happens is if we don't honor an opening up non-dual existence and we get all banal and lazy and just watch TV for seven hours a night, <laughs> and, you know, that's not really a kind of a liberated uh, art of dying non-dual existence. Okay, so there's another invitation we have to look at is our gray holes where we settle into our beer. And then we have it all justified. Oh, this, I'm just being realistic, you know. You can't be blown wide open with a career. <laughs> well, look at, look at this useless person. I'm poking along, totally useless. Today, we'll see what happens. Okay, so it's an invitation to get over this banality crap. Live the life of art and dying. Live the life of intensity. Start taking the risks. Okay. So it is a risk-taking existence that's appointed to. And so... Because it's a risk-taking existence, and even today it's a risk-taking existence, we're going to push the envelope even a little further today to such terrorizing things such as fear, trauma, and hell. Okay? So, and we're going to see hell from a joyous perspective today. So, let's... Let, the joy of hell. The ecstasy of hell. Okay? So now we're going to go into, I would call this like... It reminded me of the jagged little pill, but of Alanis Morissette, but it's like a jagged blackness, okay? Jagged black. And the thing about this is when a person starts, um, I always think it's such a good sign when a person says to me, I never realized how much I'm always fearful. Like, I never realized, like, I am just a, a, a mess. I'm just fearful all the time. I'm having panic attacks. Now, if you've had panic attacks, they're not pretty. But I think, wonderful. Good news. Come on in. Because, you see, with panic attacks, what's happened is, oh, okay, you're, you're, the abyss is showing up in your life. And that means everything's being deconstructed. And you're in, now you're in the swamp because your little ego's trying to survive and the abyss of existence is showing up all over the place. So that's a wonderful opportunity. You see, sometimes, you know, we won't surrender until sort of surrender is forced upon us. And that's a beauty, beautiful thing about a panic attack. It's so bad because you're so, you lost your functioning. You see, you can't even pull off your normal nice person functioning and make little speeches and look at everybody. And, because you see, it doesn't work anymore. You know, the way you manage all your relationships and, you know, I'll scratch your ego, you scratch my ego, everything goes along, blah, blah. It doesn't work. And you're in the actually, ab actual abyss. So, we have to be willing to work on fear and trauma. And with fear, I always like what Adyashanti uh, had a nice little discourse on that was wonderful. 
And that is the day you realize there's nothing you can do about fear. Because you see, anything that we do to manage fear tends to keep it more in motion. And so, for example, say we're going to be talking on TV later on today. They thought you were so wonderful they want to interview you on the national news. Uh, we'll start grabbing on to and try to make it okay now. But can we make it something okay now that's going to happen at 6 o'clock tonight? No. Can we make it psychologically okay? No, we can't actually in this moment make a future moment secure. But we still try hard and our mind will come up with a little strategy. Oh, deep breathing and you try a few deep breaths and it goes pretty well until you get there. And then you go, oh, I didn't know it was going to be like this. Uh, or we have a little CBT strategies, <laughs> distortions, blah, blah, little non-dual sayings. We try to surrender. <laughs> and, uh, and then we, the day we realize is not, you, you, one has to embrace the wisdom of insecurity. Nothing can be done. In this no moment, we can't psychologically make the next moment secure. So all we can do is do nothing. And it's a release. Nothing to do. So. Nothing can be done. And so we relax. We give up all our strategies. Nothing can be done. And in the moment when it happens, we surrender in that moment. Because even in this moment, nothing can be done. So there's a letting go of all this striving and managing of fear. And we just realize fear is just energy. And with no judgment, it's just energy. And as Christian Marie would say, we realize what, it's OK. It's like fear, fear is like a snake in the room. I can remember having like. I won't get into the long story, but I have a bad <laughs> record with having to do um, eulogies at funerals. And um, <laughs> what happened is, look, a couple of years ago, for example, one of our ex-master students died, but I hadn't seen for five years. And I said, God, oh, I'm OK then. Uh, it's, it's, it's in another city. I don't have to have anything to do with the situation. I can just ride it out. And then, of course, about two hours later, I got a phone call <laughs> from his, his wife saying, he's asked you to be, do the eulogy at the funeral. And he was a popular person in town, and so you go there, and there's like 300 people there. But there's nothing can be done. Make a few notes, nothing can be done. And just surrender, nothing can be done. Even if it's a, something like a eulogy, nothing can be done. So I enjoyed it totally. So fear is just a, a, an invitation for us to let go of all our magic. That can even now extend. You see, now what the invitation today, though, is going to take it even further. Uh, what we've talked about the basically, we already got into the fear of no self and the letting go. Jed McCann talked a lot about that. And that's the same thing like the midnight sun. You realize uh, there's no point trying to save yourself. You've got to let it all go. Give up the struggle. Be one with existence or non existence in the moment. <coughs> And then the vastness of existence reveals itself. Boom. And so there's no way to angle it. There's no way to work it. And just accept there's no separate self that can save you. So with that notion, I want to even extend now into trauma. Now, I'm going to press people here a bit of a, in trauma because we tend to have a trauma-based existence where people get caught in trauma and perpetually working on trauma. I was just talking to someone yesterday, First Nations uh, professor from up in Edmonton, and he was talking about the same thing about trauma. People in First Nations specifically, they, they do residential school abuse trauma, and they do more and more trauma, and they're always doing more trauma, 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 more trauma. And when does it ever end? When do you get to get out? When do you get your get out of jail card? <laughs> so this is an invitation today and it's going to push the limits around the work we do around trauma. And what I'm going to show you today is that we tend to do, we do trauma to ourselves. Okay? So it's not so much a situation that trauma happens from some other source. <coughs> we end up actually putting a knife into our own bellies with trauma. Okay? So what this is, is an invitation then to go beyond being stuck in victimhood around trauma. So first thing with trauma, and this is sort of going beyond, we'll say, say for example, a person's already worked somewhat on their trauma. They've got into, Marcy is here, I know she likes to talk about the window of tolerance. They've got into some 
level of that the least they can talk about, where it's not too hypo, where the energy's not so hyped up that it's just zeroing off the universe. It's not so hypo that's so dead that you can't even work with it. We'll assume that there's some openness now to working on trauma. The first thing that has to go with trauma is our sense of our split mind. Our sense of the whole story around our trauma. For example, I had trauma in grade eight when I had beautiful long hair and I was a goalie playing all-star hockey. I had a good gig going. And my father was anti-hippie. He was a doctor who was anti-hippie uh, fellow. And so he dragged me out to the sun deck and with a, with a razor, you know those barber razors, like kind of what they do in prison. They give you like a 30 second haircut. He gave me like a 30 second haircut where it left my hair like two inches long and I was absolutely devastated and horrified and humiliated and shamed because this wonderful haircut, my most shaggy hair was gone and I felt humiliated. Now, and of course I got stuck there and I was like a deer in the headlights and I lost my ability to physically react in the moment. So in going back to heal that though, the first thing I had to notice is if I, if I go through the experience, what's really bad about the whole experience is not actually the little haircut. Well, physically, it's just a haircut. What's bad is the commentary. I, my split mind, how much I said, this is awful. This is terrible. Oh, my God. Oh, uh, oh the kids are going to make, make so much fun of me. They're going to humiliate me. <coughs> and so what happens then if I can just let that commentary go and go back, re-experience the experience, but this time, let the split mind go with no commentary and just be in that experience. And then let the energy complete itself. Let the grief, let all the intense energy, let it, because it got frozen. And I sat there frozen in time, and I was frozen for 20 years. So let that energy complete itself. And also, and it can be very intense, and you know, oh, you know, very, very intense, but it surges, <coughs> and then it completes itself. Okay, and then when I realized, oh, I need to get my physicality back, and then I, I played this out, and I, I you know, I kind of half bopped him, gave him an <laughs> elbow, and I jumped over the railing, and I'm gone. Da 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 da. I got my physicality back, because what can happen is that deer in the headlights thing of that situation I'd carried with me. Anytime I'd be around a person of authority, it'd be like replaying this all out again, and so I'd be getting into a real fear trauma place and get on a real hate on for authority and it was totally like getting pretty far gone. Especially if you work at a university, there's a lot of people in authority marching around. <laughs> so it's pretty unacceptable if you start sort of saying F you to everybody. <laughs> so I had to let it go. Okay, and then by letting it go, it's back into essence. Okay, but you see, and that was, and that's a fairly consistent with people like Peter Levine and that sort of thing, all the embodied trauma people, but I had to take it even one step further. Okay, and that is a realization that really at the heart of trauma is this kind of sense of, I don't want to die, I don't want to die, I don't want to die. It's this utter panic, this utter grasping at selfhood. And so, unless that's unpacked, trauma situations will keep showing up. Because have you noticed? Our existence gets threatened all the time. Like in the last two years or three years, I encountered a bear on a five mile run, uh, just like right where that camera is for me. And that was an invitation to let go. And, and then of course run. <laughs> <laughs> Surreally though. And then uh, about uh, a, little, a year later, I had the, I nicely put the whole family over an embankment up by <laughs> Glacier Park in, in uh, Nelson drove off the edge, we lost a wheel and went over and we went off the deep end over the edge into down an embankment. That's an invitation to let go, surrender. And then this last year, I never heard any, this, people said moose, you gotta watch the moose. <laughs> and we were on a little running trail in Fernie and we're right where about Jason is and we came around this bend and up there is a moose and all of a sudden the moose decides, oh, goes crazy and starts rushing at us, totally intensely and tries to run us, run us down. So we had to jump off the trail into an, an down embankment. But that was okay because it's all, because I had actually accepted the fact I can't be grasping onto survivalhood in each moment. I've got to let go of the need to survive. So you see, 
But the problem is it always comes back to this midnight blackness thing. You got to let go of our hanging on to survivalhood. Okay, and in that, the trauma healing can really kind of extend itself to a full presence and a let go. Okay, now, what tends to happen though is in life, we tend to only somewhat get that, and we are busy kind of embracing our happenings and taking our risk, but we may not have a full let go. And life has its own happening. And sometimes we actually get a, a lot more than we bargained for. I'm going to show you a little clip from a movie called The Counselor. And I can relate. This is I mean being an ex-liar. Uh, this is about a, a lawyer who wants to make a quick cash grab. So he all of a sudden tries to get into the drug, deal, drug dealing business for a $20 million deal. $20 million deal. And the whole deal goes sour. And so the, the drug people grab his wife. And they're going to snuff her. Because when, you don't, when, when someone takes off with the $20 million, that's what I, I guess that's sort of the type of thing that happens. <laughs> and so here we have a scene where he's actually calling the big drug kingpin in Mexico and trying to work something out. Hopefully it'll Little technical problem all of a sudden. Yeah. Oh. Yes, Thank but you. I can only tell you what I already told our friend. There's no one to talk to. Could I come to the Florida? The Florida is closed. I would do whatever you suggest. I have no suggestions, Counselor. We could meet someplace. We're meeting now. <laughs> I'm not sure you understand my position. But I do, Counselor. Actions create consequences which produce new worlds, and they're all different. Where the bodies are buried in the desert, that is a certain world. Where the bodies are simply left to be found, that is another. And all these worlds, here to four unknown to us. They must have always been there, must they not? Yeah. I don't know. Did you say something? I don't know what I was saying. Counselor, at some point, you have to acknowledge the reality of the world that you're in. There is not some other world. This is not a hiatus. A hiatus. <laughs> I believe the word is hiatus. Can you spell that for me, please? H-I-A-T-U-S. Hiatus. Thank you, Counselor. Will you help me? I would urge you to see the truth of the situation you're in, Counselor. That is my advice. It is not for me to tell you what you should have done or not done. The world in which you seek to undo the mistakes that you made is different from the world where the mistakes were made. You are now at the crossing, and you want to choose, but there is no choosing. There's only accepting. The choosing was done a long time ago. Are you there, Counselor? Yes. I don't mean to offend you, but reflective men often find themselves at a place removed from the realities of life. In any case, we should all prepare a place where we can accommodate all the tragedies that sooner or later will come to our lives. But this is an economy few people care to practice. Do you know the words of Machado? I know his name. Caminante no hay camino, se hace camino al andar. Lovely poet. Machado was a school teacher, and he married a young, beautiful girl, and he loved her very much, and she died. And then he became a great poet. I'm not going to become a great poet. 
Well, perhaps not, Padina. If you were to do so, it would not help you. My child would have traded every word, every poem, every verse he ever wrote for one more hour with his beloved. And that is because when it comes to grief, the normal rules of exchange do not apply because grief transcends value. A man would give entire nations to let grief off his heart, and yet... You cannot buy anything with grief because grief is worthless. Why are you telling me this? Because you continue to deny the reality of the world you're in. Do you love your wife so much, so completely, that you would exchange places with her upon the wheel? And I don't mean dying, because dying is easy. Yes! Yes, damn you! Well, that is good to hear, Counselor. What are you saying? Are you saying that this is a possibility? No. It's impossible. You said I was that man at that crossing. Yes, at the understanding that life is not going to take you back. You are the world you have created. And when you cease to exist, this world that you have created will also cease to exist. But for those with the understanding that they're living the last days of the world, death acquires a different meaning. The extinction of all reality is a concept no resignation can encompass. And yet, in that despair, which is transcendent, you will find the ancient understanding that the Philosopher's Stone will always be found despised and buried in the mud. This may seem a small thing in the face of annihilation until annihilation occurs. And then all the grand designs and all the grand plans will be finally exposed and revealed for what they are. And now, Counselor, I have to go because I have to make other calls. If I have time, I think I'll take a, a small nap. So, and I would invite us just as we finish watching that uh, little piece in the film, is we just sit in that place where everything's deconstructed with no judgment, and just be open to, the, to what's available in that place. But we're going to carry on here. And we're going to work a little bit on uh, a veiled darkness, uh, veiled blackness holes. And the first thing we're going to talk about, this can be a little bit hard sometimes, is talking about hell realm experiences. I, I don't like to talk about it too much, but they happen. And the first part about, though, I want to talk about is that, and almost does a nice job, is that actually. Uh, we always like to see the real darkness outside ourselves. It's always the devil out there or the evil presence out there. It's always the hatred and the killing energy out there. But what can be actually very uh, transformational is for all of us to own our own blackness and own, like, reverse that projection and own that own darkness and integrate it. Now, if uh, we were working one-on-one, -on -one, I'd probably have someone come up here, and then that person could get in touch with someone that they really hate, and then they can start yelling, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you, to an empty chair. But what can be funny is that black hatred, which seems to be very like rough and aggressive, if it's totally accepted and 
honoured and put out there in a, a non-harmful way to an empty chair, that energy can expand. And all of a sudden, that black hatred becomes a vastness and it becomes a black power of existence. Not a shut down, like destructive, aggressive uh, blackness, but a whole expansiveness. You see, because we have to deal, as Trumpka talked about, the bar realm of hell, there is a level of aggressiveness and darkness in existence. I mean, if Adolf Hitler's armies were coming into town, I think a little bit of total aggressiveness might come in handy for all of us. And if we just sat here like being like Buddhas, it might not go down so well for us. <laughs> so the thing is, we want to integrate that blackness, but not just in a disconnected way where it comes out sideways. You know, we want to integrate where we use that energy and enjoy the black vastness of existence. How many people have seen the Godzilla movie? I haven't either. <laughs> but I just thought there's that one part where I think where the, where the big Godzilla, uh, you know, Godzilla comes and starts smashing like apartment buildings and hotels and skyscrapers. And there's a part of us that would love to do that. We're like all destroyers. We all get into a mood sometimes where we just want to destroy stuff. Okay? But that's an aspect of existence. Now, what I want to, well, I was going to do this in a real over the top way, but instead, what I want to try is a little experiment today. What I want you to do is, in about a few moments here, I want us to enjoy, with no judgment, saying, I hate you, out loud. But let's try it a few number of times and see what happens to the energy if we just do it with intensity, with no judgment. Are you willing to, and I'll take total responsibility. And I, I know this will kind of interrupt your whole gig of being a beautiful, loving person. But you can blame it on me. Okay? So can we try this together? Okay? Okay. First time. All together. And do it with like you're enjoying yourself. Like, let's do it like I'm enjoying myself. Okay? First time. I hate you! Okay, again. <laughs> I hate you! Again. Again. I hate you. 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 Okay, let's okay. Now let's do it like five times quickly. I hate you. 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 Now what's happening to your energy? Does it feel like hate energy? No. You notice how if you get into it, it expands. And all of a sudden a bunch of you are laughing. Because you've integrated the darkness and expressed it and allowed it to expand. And it can be very helpful because all of us feel, oh, I have no power, I can't handle situations. Well, you just do your I hate you exercise in your, in your room for about 10 minutes before you go down to your meeting. <laughs> But it expands, and then you naturally, spontaneously feel your black vastness of being, because black is an aspect of existence. You're integrating it, and you're not rushing around pointing fingers, you know? You're the devil, you're the devil, you're the devil. Okay? And you own it in a non-dual, non-judgmental way. And you can feel the ecstasy of blackness. Okay? So there's, a, there's an element of that where it's integrating the blackness. Now, if we take it even further, if we want to look, a so much of hell is that we get into a situation where, well, for example, has anybody been around someone that's dying and, they're and they're, they don't want to die and they have a panic attack? You see, that's hell. Because when you're dying and you're trying to grasp that survivalhood and you're just trying to grab at some sense of survivalhood no matter what. And that puts you in, like, oh my, it puts you in hell. Be and that's where existence becomes very, seems very devilish because you're hanging on. The time to surrender and you're hanging on. You're grasping that survival hood no matter what. And who knows what's going to happen when you leave your body if you're grasping that survival hood. Good luck. I don't think a ghost existence is that good of an existence, but give it a try. Because <laughs> you're hanging on. You want to meander around here for a while? Good luck with hanging on. But that's what can happen. And it feels like we're, we're really hanging on tightly and it feels very dark and very like hell devilish and the thing is in an instant though you notice when we're, we're, we're hanging on in an instant we let go all of a sudden that very dark density can truly transform itself into a nice vast surrendered lightness a nice vast flowingness but that means we let go of needing to survive 
And that can happen in all sorts of situations, all the time in day-to-day -day life. Okay? And so we need to, to embrace the ongoing art of diving. Uh, diving, dying. <laughs> but it even gets worse, you see, is that we can, we can, uh, there's, a, there's actually fates worse than, so there's the, the ongoing art of dying that we need to just let go of grasping at survivalhood, but there's fates worse than death itself. And so, I mean, if some of you are old druggies, you'll know, you'll have visited this, where you can get into realms beyond realms where you get a bad drug trip, and it can happen with norm, in normal, normally with each one of us, where we get into a realm beyond death, and we get into some sort of realm where it's like a, like a hell realm of eternal bewilderment and aloneness and eternally sent off to never see anybody other being in existence forever. Eternally stuck in hell with no chance of relations forever. Just try that one out for a while. And uh, if, you're, if you're in that fear place, that does not feel very good. It feels pretty frying. It pre feels pretty terrorizing. But then what happens? Now, here's the invitation. What happens, though, if we just accept, okay, I'm in hell forever. I'm in aloneness forever. Just accept it. What happens to a sense of total darkness forever if we just accept it. There's lots of nice accounts. Rents has a, Carl Rents has a nice account of the myth of enlightenment, how he just he accepted that invitation if he was in hell forever, and he just accepted it. Because what's revealed is our eternal participation in existence. We're here for the duration. There's an ongoing aspect of us totally that's around. So you're just accepting your eternal aloneness. Eternal aloneness accepted becomes a nice bedazzling integrated light, luminous black energy into lightness. If it's, if it's judged and frightened and rejected, it turns into, oh my God, oh, I'm in fucking hell. Oops, I wasn't supposed to swear. I'm in, I'm in hell. Okay, but hell accepted turns into dark ecstasy, releasement. Okay, and so what you're doing is, you see now, if you can make your home in hell, you're good to go. <laughs> Like, what are you, you going to be fighting about now? You're good to go, even in hell. You've made hell fine. You're enjoying yourself. Okay? So you see the things, and some of you might say, well, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Well, just take a note of this. <laughs> you might, this might come in handy one day. <laughs> just remember this. Okay? Okay, so... And we can actually even, if we really want to work on this, we can even extend our awareness of all this <coughs> into deconstructing the whole hell realm altogether. Because the whole hell realm is based on sort of some weird assumptions. But if we see, like the Buddha and all, so many other people, that there is no goal, there is nowhere to get to, everything's available right here, right now, then that means that, well, then no one's in a, a preferred pla uh, better place than anybody else. That means that we, don't ha we, we can let go of this sort of, like, we can sort of see there's nobody in charge, there's nobody. We're doing this hell thing to ourselves. It's all a mind game that we're doing to ourselves. And when that's seen, we can see we're embrace, we can embrace freedom right now. We can deconstruct the whole thing right here, right now. Okay, and that's freedom. You're out of it. You see it. It makes you laugh. You know, it makes a person laugh when you realize, I've been doing this miserable hell suffering all to myself. <laughs> Like, for example, if you can feel yourself being feeling guilty, that's a good thing to carry. And then you think, oh, okay, I'm going to create a big health because I feel guilty. But if you just deconstruct the whole thing, and you your freedom right here, right now. Okay, so we can open up to existence right here, right now. Freedom now. Okay, and now the other invitation, though, is uh, sometimes we've done all this work and still something's off. And so that might be an invitation. Maybe sometimes some of us have to like to do some Groff's holotropic birth trauma work because there's some trauma happened at, at birth. Uh, maybe you, you were stuck in like a no exit place in the birth canal or something happened. Or, you know, you can't figure anything out, but there's still something going on. That might be an invitation to do some past life regression work. It doesn't matter whether you believe in past life uh, past lives or not, if you do some past life regression work and it helps, that's pretty important. 
You don't, we don't, we're not going to have a big long debate about it today, but it, it can be a, a place to go if you've got some darkness patterns that you can't figure out, okay? Or there can be some darkness patterns and maybe need to go to work with a shamanic facilitator for a little while. Just because there's some stuff that's going on that you can't quite get to figure out, sometimes a shamanic counselor for, uh, being can be very helpful. But these are ways to actually just work on all these dark holes. Because these dark holes are, are portals to non-dual waking. You see, and then what can happen now? It, what can also happen is we've done all. We can get to a situation where we've done all of this, we've done all of that, and, and even then something something's off. You see, and then finally we actually may revisit this place where we realize we've done everything. We've done it all. We've tried everything, we've done all the different healings, we've done the past life regression, we've done the birth trauma, we've done the other trauma, we've done shamanic healing, we've done the fear stuff, we've, we've done all the you know, stuff around our family origin stuff, we've done all the questing, we've done everything, and yet there's still a sense of hanging on, and yet there can be a, still a sense of somehow something's not right, you see, and that becomes the invitation right there for all of us to realize, at some point, we just got to let it all go. And that's, we're going to do a little meditation right here right now, where I wanted you to join uh, me. And this is called Letting Go Your Project Meditation. <laughs> okay, so in this moment, we close our eyes. And I want us to look at our whole life and how we've been trying so hard. We've tried so many di different techniques, so much different healing, so many different approaches, been to counselors, been to healers, tried so hard ourselves. We've always been <coughs> trying, trying, trying. Always so much effort. And who knows, it may not have only been for this lifetime, it may have been for many previous lifetimes. Always so much effort, always so much trying. And now we realize Okay, I gotta let go of my whole awakening project. I gotta let it all go. Everything. It's all been based on a desire for awakening. I let it all go. The whole onslaught. I let go of my project. I let go of my little separate self dream. I let it all go. I'm gonna stop hanging on. I'm not. I'm gonna stop grabbing. I just see. I have. I can't hang on anymore. It's now just turned to misery and suffering. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to let it all go. Right here, right now, I say <coughs> no more effort, no more striving, no more trying. That's it. I let it all go. So just sit there in the happiness of no effort. Let it all go. And just enjoy no effort. No more effort. Let it all go. Feel the sublimeness of no effort. Feel the sublimeness of nothing to do. There's nothing to do. No effort. I can just relax. Just embrace relaxing. Okay. Let's just sit here in a mo for a minute of no effort. Beautiful, no effort. Okay, now for a way to celebrate this, is we're going to finish.
finishes off with a two minute little thing where for two minutes, I want us all to just do whatever. And uh, usually I have some of sort of nice Kate Bush finish up <coughs> closing meditation, but this is gonna be different today. This is gonna be Neil Young. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so what we're gonna do is just a chance to shake the cobwebs out, do whatever. Come on, Jason, come on, shake it out, come on, come on, shake it out, come on, let it all go, let it all hang out, come on. Thank you, Daniel. That was good. <laughs> Reset. Okay. And we're winding down of our first presentation. Thank you all for being involved through all your uh, your final screaming and your your hate you state your sublime loving hate you statements. And we're going to take like a twenty minute coffee break. And when we come back, we'll have Canal.